Okay, so by memory, I am going to attempt to do Bobby Fischer's very famous game of the century, which was played at the Rosenwald Memorial Tournament in upstate New York, 1956. As I was saying before, Bobby had just turned 13 years of age the week before this tournament, and he was playing Donald Byrne, who was the white pieces, Bobby Fischer was the, were the black pieces, and they had heard about this young kid who was supposed to be a chess phenom. And Burns started with knight f3. Now this opening move for white has been considered the best opening move now by computer analysis, better than e4, d4, or c4. I think the computer has finally realized that when you clear out one of the two pieces before you can castle on the very first move, it's a lot easier to castle pawn out, bishop up, and you're going to be able to castle on the fourth move. And so it's probably why the computer has said this is the best opening move. Also remember the fight for chess is the center squares, and so right away you're controlling two center squares. And Fisher, being a young prodigy, said, well, if it's good enough for you, Donald, it's certainly good enough for me. And so he did the same thing with the idea of maybe pawn here, bishop here, and then castle this way. Burn pushed c4 to control this square an extra time because this knight was controlling it, this pawn is now controlling it, and so basically he was um, countering Fisher's control of the d5 square. Bobby pushed g6, so what do you think his idea is immediately? Immediately, g bishop g7, and he's going to castle, okay? knight c3, so it's almost like an English opening in a way. This knight now controls these two squares, which counteracts the effect of this knight. Bobby said, okay, here we go. I will give you the center for a few moves, but I will castle my king and be very safe in my cubby hole. So Byrne took the center, but you notice that he didn't push one of these two pawns to get the bishop out getting ready to castle. He's telling this young 13-year-old prodigy, I'm going to fight you for these four center squares. You may have a safe king, but I'm going to control the center. And in chess, there's always a balance for every move that you make, a plus and a minus. And every single time you make a move, you have to determine whether the plus is more than the minus. And that means in every single position, from the opening to the mid game to the end game. So right now, Bobby said, OK. You've got the center, Mr. Byrne, but I have a very safe king that's been castled. So, let's take a look. Uh, after uh, this, I'm pretty sure, yes, here, bishop to f4. Again, developing the queen side over the king side. And Bobby said, you know, since I have a safe king and we're fighting for the center, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to fight you for the center right away. D5. So if pawn takes, knight takes, if knight takes, queen takes. And everything is even, and Bobby will have two pieces developed. He'll be controlling the center a little more than black. So white said, you know, instead of me taking, and in chess, the general rule is usually it's better to have your opponent initiate the take. Excuse me. Oh, great. Thank you. All right. Very good. And so far, we're OK. Yep. I'm actually uh, doing very well. I've actually got it all together right here. <laughs> I haven't made a mistake yet. OK. So after d5, queen b3, and uh, queen out. So instead of white taking black, He's telling Fisher, I've developed a piece so that if you take me, I'll just take you back and we're still even. And I got another piece on the board. Look, one, two, three, four. You only have two. 
and that's true, he would have more development, but how many moves safer is this king than this king? Four, Four according to computer analysis. And so Bobby is saying, yeah, that's true, but my king is safe, yours is still not safe. So sure enough, Bobby took the pawn, and Byrne took the pawn, and so you have an even Stevens swap of one point, one point. Okay, so the queen took the pawn. Now, if you see this bishop is aiming at this pawn at c7, the queen is now aiming at this pawn at c7, so it's being attacked how many times? And it's only guarded once. So Fisher had to say, well, you know, at the highest levels, one little pawn is enough to lose the game. You can't, guys, when you're playing chess, especially you kids, you can't say it's only a pawn. A pawn means a win, okay, especially at the highest level. Now, if you play absolutely perfect chess for the rest of the game and you're down a pawn, if you play extremely well, you might draw, which means you will tie instead of losing or winning, and a, a draw is better than a loss. But you're playing not to lose, so it's a whole different ball game. So the idea is don't even go down that little pawn, okay? That one little pawn is enough to lose the game. So all Bobby did is he just pushed the pawn out of the way. Just pushed it. Now it's guarded by here and here. Now the bishop could take the knight, but knights are three points, bishops in endgame are four. So I don't think Byrne wanted to give up a point, okay, three for four. Now back then, they hadn't done the computer analysis to show that in the end game, bishops are four points. But let me tell you, for the last 150 years, if you study the millions of master and grandmaster games that are out there on the databases, they love to lose their knights for your bishops. They want your bishops all the time. Because they realize going to end game, the bishop is a full point more powerful than the knight in end game. So they want to do this most of the time. Now there are times that you just have to give up a bishop for a knight. The knight's forking queen and rook or king or something. You just have to do it. And But they were very reluctant to do it. Okay, so after c6, he finally pushes e4 with the threat of pushing against here. Okay, and so after e4, Bobby said, I better start developing. Okay, and sure enough, yep, yep, I'm right. Knight d7. Now, he blocks off this bishop, but only for one move. But what do you think the idea, where do you think this knight's going to go on the next move? I think b6 to attack the queen and t get a tempo, right? And again, what Byrne should have done is probably brought the bishop up and just castled. And he could have just moved his queen away if the knight comes here. But he brought the rook over to x-ray the queen. And now there's obviously two things in front of that rook, a pawn and a knight, but he's telling young Fisher, I'm coming for your queen. But he also neglected to bring the bishop out and get ready to castle. So sure enough, Bobby took his tempo, gets a free move, and he attacks the queen. Well, the queen has a lot of different places to go. She decided to go up because she can always just slide back if she gets attacked. Okay. So let's see. I believe he brought his bishop out to g4 after that, right? Yep, he sure did. My memory hasn't gone yet, guys. There is now a pin on this knight. Now, normally the queen is sitting here and you're pinning the knight to the queen, but it works just as well with a rook. Rooks are worth five points, it's a major piece. And so you still have a pin, three point over a five point, okay? And I think at this point, what Byrne probably should have done is probably just brought the bishop out, taken away the pin and just get ready to castle, you know? I don't, I, I don't know why he was fussing around with this kid, but I, I understand why, okay? Okay, so what he did was he moved here because there was no more attacking possibilities on this diagonal. He was controlling the squares, but there was nothing there. At least here, he's preventing Fisher from pushing this pawn to e6 or e5 because he will create a pin on Bobby's queen with this knight. Okay, 
So after g5, bishop to g5, this is the move that started Fisher's um, reputation. This is not the queen sacrifice, which is coming in a little later, but a brilliant idea. Knight a4. At first look, that looks pretty good. Look, he's forking the queen and he's forking the knight. He's got to tell the queen's got to move again. But what's wrong with that? Immediately you guys see, hey, wait a minute. Didn't he give away a free knight? Isn't that knight just hanging there? Why can't this knight just take this guy for free? Well, obviously he can. He can take him for free. But what's the job of this knight right now? It's guarding the e4 pawn. So that if this knight takes this knight and he's no longer here guarding the e4 pawn, this knight can come in here and take the e4 pawn and fork the queen and the bishop. Now, what's protecting the bishop is this queen and this knight, but the knight's pinned to the rook. So if the queen wants to keep guarding the bishop, it has to stay on the fifth rank. Well, let's see. It can't go here, the pawn will take it. it. Can't go here, the queen will take it for free. Can't go here, the knight, the queen, and the pawn would take it. If it goes here, let's see what would happen if it went there. We might. The bishop. Yeah, this bishop. Or this the bishop. Pawn. Oh, after the knight moves? The knight yeah, yeah. And I think the queen is trapped. I don't think it could escape. Could it escape? It might be able to escape. Well, he could have tried over here, I think, at e5. I, I think it's too dangerous, though. So what he did was, after he attacked, which was very interesting, and looking at all the possibilities, he just decided, hey, I'll just retreat. It's a very clever young man, but I don't want to give you this center square. It'll open up my king. I haven't castled yet, and it's just not worth it. So Bobby said, okay, I understand here. And here, so again, we're trading even Stephen, two knights for two knights. Pawn took the knight back, right? But after this knight is gone, this pawn, okay. And so you've taken the pawn and you're attacking the bishop. The problem with this is and everybody said, well, wait a minute, that looks good, but there's a problem with that. This bishop now can attack e7, and so can the queen. And it's only guarded once. And sure enough, Byrne didn't see anything wrong with that, and so he took the pawn, and everybody in the world said, oh, that poor kid. He just lost at least a rook for a bishop. He's down in exchange. He's probably going to lose the game. Even if he saves his queen, he's going to lose the rook. Interesting move, huh? All right, so bishop takes e7. After bishop takes e7, the queen saves itself, queen b6. And everybody thought, well, Byrne probably should have taken the rook, but he didn't do that. All right, let's take a look at this. Uh, there's an intermezzo move here. Let's take a look. There was a move, yes. There was an intermezzo move. I made two moves for white, I'm sorry. There was a knight take c3. And now what he does is he attacks the queen. Okay, so instead of taking the rook, he attacks the queen. Um, I think I missed a sequence here. This bishop had come out earlier, and he had get ready to castle. I, I missed two moves reading it off the computer. All right, when he attacks his queen, Everybody said, okay, the game's pretty much over because once he moves his queen, he'll just lose a rook and then he's going to lose this knight. 
And here's the genius of Fisher right now. The first thing he did is he checked the king. Okay, you cannot take the queen if the rook is checking the king. Well, let's see what the king can do. If you block with the bishop, you just take and say check because it's protected by the knight, so you can't do that. Uh, let's see. Let's see. If you block with this knight, then you lose the rook here for free because the knight and the bishop will be on it. If you come up, that might work for a moment. Let's take a look. I think the knight would probably come back and temple the queen, and the king wouldn't be able to castle, and he'd be stuck in the center, and all these pieces are going to be coming down on him. So basically what he said was, is, okay, I'll just move away. And because he didn't castle earlier, he lost the privilege to castle now by moving his king. And this rook is trapped. But Fisher's queen is still under attack. And everybody said, oh, poor Bobby, he's going to lose now because Byrne just saved his king. And here's what Fisher saw. And I don't think he saw 18 moves into the future. But he moved the bishop to e6, and he said, take my queen. Well, Byrne is a master. Obviously, he's going to say, okay, what's the trick? What's the idea behind this? Why are you giving up a queen? All right, let me look at this and calculate this in my head. If I take your queen, you will take my bishop and say, check to my king. I won't be able to go anywhere here because the rook will stop me, so I'll have to go back here. Then I see your knight will come in here and check me here. I'll have to come back here and you'll do this. And I'll be in a windmill, but at the end of the whole sequence of checks, I will have lost this bishop, this rook, and maybe this pawn, and that's it. So I'm going to get your queen for five, four, and one is ten which is roughly even, and it's very clever, young man, but I will still have your queen, and I think I'm gonna win. And so, Byrne said, thank you for your queen. Okay, this game almost plays itself out for the next 18 moves. So, let's see the sequence that Byrne did in his head. And this is what Bobby did. Bishop takes, bishop, check. You can't go anywhere here. So he just came over here. The knight now checked the king. The king has no choice but to go back here. And when you move the knight away, he took this pawn, and you get a what kind of check? Discovered, discovered check. Like Columbus discovered America, you get a discovered check. Well, again, the king can't go anywhere here, so he has to go back here. The knight went back here. The king went back here. And this time, Bobby went back here for the discovered check so he can take the rook. And Byrne said, okay, that's fine and dandy. You got my rook. You got my bishop. You got my pawn. But I still have your queen, and I think I'm going to win anyway because even though my king might be here, Eventually, my queen is going to be too strong for you to overcome. And everybody in the world thought Bobby would take this, including Byrne and all the other grandmasters that were analyzing this game, said, yes, that's what we're going to do. And unfortunately, Fisher probably will wind up losing. But nobody in the world saw the move that's coming up except Bobby. And he calculated it before this whole sequence of windmill moves. Anybody see the move? What is it? Bishop to e2 here and fork the rook and the knight? No, because it'll still give him enough time. He'll just move maybe an attack along here. He needs a sequence of tempo busters, which are forced moves that Byrne has to respond to, not that he can choose to respond to or not. What? Knight e2 check, he's already done. He's already done the sequence. He did everything he wanted to at that sequence. Jonathan, what is it? Uh, uh, pawn takes b6. Yes. Pawn takes bishop. And now the rook attacks the queen. The queen can't take the knight because it's protected by the bishop. 
the queen can't take the rook because it's protected by the rook. So now Fisher has two bishops and a pawn for a queen. Nine to ten. He's still a point down, so let's see how it's going to work out. Well, the queen just came over here to attack the bishop. And Bobby said, uh-uh. Now, to me, this for I want you guys to look at this formation because in my mind, in the whole history of chess, I don't think there's been a greater formation and synchronicity of pieces than this particular formation in the entire history. This rook attacks the queen, but it also guards the bishop, which was under attack by the queen. The queen cannot take the rook because it's guarded by the knight, which is guarded by the bishop. Look at these four pieces in perfect harmony, how they combine to create that sequence, that formation. So this queen was done. It had no choice. It just gobbled a simple pawn, and now Fisher took the rook. So at the end of the sequence, Bobby got a rook, two bishops, and a pawn for a queen and a pawn, which was 14 points to 11, which put him three points up. And this rook is trapped. And so, after he took here, Burns saw that if he comes down here, this will be checkmate once this knight is gone. So he created an escape square for his king. And Bobby said, oh good, let's just keep taking your stuff. Remember Bernadette Peters in the old movie The Jerk with Steve Martin? It's not the money, it's the stuff. Stuff he's going to be taking, okay? So the king gets off the check. The knight takes another pawn. As you can see, going into end game or late mid game right now, Fisher has 10, 18, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26 points in power, and Byrne has 15. My God. It's 11. That's ridiculous. Okay. Well, he has 5, so 16 to 26. 10 points. He says, and Burns said, I can't let you have two rooks. Let's trade. And so Bobby said, okay, we'll trade. And Burns probably should have taken the rook back right away, but he didn't because he was so upset that he missed pawn takes bishop, which created this whole sequence that he gave Fisher what we call in chess a spite check. This check does absolutely nothing other than say, hey look, I can check your king. And of course Bobby's only move is to block. And it's true that Byrne has created a pin on this bishop, but there's so many other stuff over here. So now Byrne took the rook back. Fisher created a whole bunch of problems at this square here. Uh, queen over to attack the pawn, and Bobby said, not on my watch. Now this formation here of this pawn protecting the bishop, which protects here and here, I think this is like chrome steel. This is impenetrable. I mean, you can't break this. You're going to have to do something. You know, maybe the knight can trade off or something, but you can't break this. And these pawns are going to roll. These are past pawns. So <clears throat> Byrne decided that he would try to maybe get the knight up here, knight here, knight here, king up. Now, by raising this king, he removed what? The pin. The pin. And if this bishop goes here and skewers the queen and the knight, because the queen can't take this bishop because the knight protects it. At the same time, the knight would be pinned to the king. So by raising this king, Bobby created this threat of bishop to d6, and so Byrne just said, I better get out of dodge. And sure enough, first check. Well, if he goes back here, then the pin gets created, so he had no choice. Now, he can't go up here. 
because of the knight and the rook. So we had to go here. And let's take a look. I believe this check here, here, this check here, can't go back, can't go up, he's got to go here. This check here with the knight, he can't go up, he can't go back, he's got to go here. This check here with the uh, no, he didn't check with the knight. Did he check with the knight? No, he didn't. Um, no, it wasn't bishop e2. D2. No, but he did check. I think he did check with the knight. But he didn't take to allow this because it was going to happen anyway. He knew it was over. So he went here. And... Uh, let me see. Let's take a look. It might have been, uh, yeah, he had to have gone here. Or where were we? Here? Okay. I'm pretty sure it was here. He went back here. And then, all right, I think, was it here? Well, the final sequence was here. The king was here. Ah, I think this knight was here. Uh, actually, I think this bishop had checked him, but was over here. Anyway, this this is the final sequence. It was mate in eight from all the way across here. As you can see, he could have checkmated him this way or this way. Because, okay, he chose the rook. Because I want, I think he wanted to get in his face and touch him. The point being, why was Bobby able to do all of this to White's king? What was the one thing White didn't do that he should have done? What was the idea of the first game I showed you? Are, am I trying to make a point here? The point is, if you don't castle early, this is what will happen to your king eight out of ten games in chess. You must castle early. And I do apologize for missing a couple of moves here, but you guys got the gist of this game. This made Fisher's reputation. This made him uh, go on the map, beating an adult who was the brother of the United States champion, and then all of a sudden it just exploded in the chess community. And um, uh, chess now is um, really enjoying a resurgence in the United States. We're in a lot of schools. I'm teaching five days a week in the public schools. Kindergartners, first grades, I, I have uh, electives for 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. Jonathan was in my class for a while over at one of the uh, junior highs I teach at. So chess is having a resurgence in schools because they have shown that the kids that stay with chess that don't give it up between 12 and 16, and most kids make that determination when they hit their teenage years or 12 years of age, the boys discover the girls, the girls discover shopping with their mom, and so their priorities change. Okay, and chess no longer becomes important. But those that stay with it between 12 and 16, when they take the SATs to get into college, they're up in the 90th percentile. Because they have stayed with chess for those years and all of the dynamics of the game, structural design, symbiotic relationships, geometric shapes, geometric designs, calculation skills, memorization skills, organizational skills, socialization skills, all of those come into play when you take the SATs, and that's why those kids score so high. Okay. All right, I'm glad you enjoyed this. We do have a tournament that starts in half an hour. You're welcome to have free play for the next 30 minutes if you want to warm up, okay? And thanks for coming, guys.